If you would open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, that will be the text for our lesson this morning. And we've been looking uh, through the Gospel of Luke for a number of weeks now. And at this point in Luke's Gospel, Jesus is on his final journey to Jerusalem. And there are a number of miscellaneous teachings that Luke has kind of compiled together throughout this journey of his that we see here in this Gospel. Um, but the result of the, there, there are various kind of recurring themes that we'll see come up. Prayer comes up multiple times, for instance, in this journey narrative between chapters 9 and 19. And another thing that we're going to see quite frequently is these warnings of being prepared or being ready because there's an impending judgment on the horizon that Jesus is describing. Now, by the time we get to Jerusalem itself in Luke chapter 21, Jesus becomes clear that he is in fact talking about the destruction of the city of Jerusalem and a historical event that took place in A.D. 70. However, uh, it's possible, in fact I think it's not just possible, it's almost certain that Jesus intends an application beyond this event as well. There are some people out there who teach that uh, Jesus actually came back in A.D. 70 and that the dead were raised and that everything's already happened and that there's nothing left. Um, well, that Teaching has extremely dangerous consequences for God's people, frankly. And uh, what you're basically saying is that God's people have no hope. Uh, but in truth, we should not teach that the resurrection has already taken place because it is still yet to come on the horizon. There was a judgment of God that took place in AD 70 at Jerusalem. And it was a judgment that ultimately points to the final judgment. It was a reminder of what Jesus would ultimately accomplish when he returned in, with his holy angels to judge all the world. And the basic message that they had for the destruction of Jerusalem, and the basic message that anybody should have at any point in their life, and the basic message that we should all have as we await the return of Jesus, is simply this. Be ready. And I told James the theme of the lesson this morning, and he picked a number of songs that centered around this idea of being ready. There is a great day coming. It is going to be a great day for some people, but it is going to be a sad day for other people who don't love the Lord. It is going to be a bright day for those who love the Lord, but for those who do not obey the gospel of His beloved Son, He will deal out retribution to them all. And in Luke chapter 12, after Jesus has given a number of instructions about making sure that we avoid fear and that we do not worry, do not worry about the persecutions that you might suffer, do not worry about the sufferings that this life has, and do not even worry about things like food and drink and clothing. In other words, we should not be obsessed about the mundane matters of this physical life to the point where we just worry and have anxiety all the time. But rather, we should seek the kingdom of God first. And if we're going to seek the kingdom of God first, if we're going to have our heart in heaven where our treasure is, we need to be prepared for that kingdom. There's a sense, of course, in which the kingdom already exists, per Acts 2, but there's another sense in which we are still waiting for God's kingdom to come. And that is why these instructions are quite applicable to us in Luke chapter 12. And there's really two things that Jesus tells us to be ready for. First of all, we need to be ready for the judgment and secondly, we need to be ready for distress. And Jesus told us not to fear persecution, but rather we need to be ready for it. There are some bad things that are going to happen to Christians. If we are truly practicing Christianity, if we are truly preaching the gospel that Christ preached, if we are truly living the life that Christ demands that we live, well, there are some implications that come with that. There are some ramifications in this life Christianity, if anybody's telling you that, you know, Yo, you become a Christian, you'll be happy, all of your problems will go away, and your life will be wonderful right now, I've got to tell you, they're probably teaching you something that isn't the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ involves suffering. Now, that doesn't sound very appealing, does it? That's not a PR campaign that most people would evaluate, but that is necessary and demanded by the work of Jesus. Jesus Himself willingly submitted to distress and suffering. And if we are going to be His disciples, we are called upon to endure the same. So these are the two things we ought to be ready for. Let's start reading in verse 35 of chapter 12. Be dressed in readiness, and keep your lamps lit. Be 
like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast, so that they may immediately open the door to him when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master will find on the alert when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will gird himself to serve and have them recline at the table and he will come up and wait on them. Whether he comes in the second watch or even in the third and finds them, so blessed are those slaves. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have allowed his house to be broken into. You too, be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour that you do not expect. Peter said, Lord, are you addressing this parable to us or to everyone else as well? And the Lord said, Who then is the faithful and sensible steward whom his master will put in charge of his servants to give them their rations at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will put him in charge of all of his possessions. But if that slave says in his heart, My master will be a long time in coming, and he begins to beat his slaves, both men and women, and to get eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him, at an hour he does not know, and will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. And that slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will will receive many lashes. But the one who did not know it and committed deeds worthy of a flogging will receive but few. From everyone who has been given much, much will be required. And to whom they entrusted much of him, they will ask all the more. <clears throat> now he, he starts off telling a few different parables here. And one of them is about this reward that is awaiting us. A reward for readiness. God rewards readiness, so we should be ready for him. You know, whenever a master goes out uh, to a feast or a wedding feast or something, his slaves are at home maintaining his house. Well, what are they supposed to do? All right, well, he's late coming home. Let's shut off the lights and go to bed. He can let himself in, right? Well, no. Leave the porch light on. Like slaves awaiting the return of their master. <clears throat> Be ready for the return of your master. There's kind of a reversal here. In verse 37, the slaves that are on the alert, that are doing what is expected of them, that do what their master wants them to do, he will gird himself to serve them. And he will reward them. Well, how did that happen? You know, he's going to come up and wait on them. That's kind of a reversal of the roles. The master is supposed to be the master, and the servants are supposed to be the ones serving. But here, he comes home, he finds his slaves doing what they expect. And he reverses the roles. There is a reward that exists for readiness. Now this is very much unlike the way the master-slave relationship works. Uh, as we would understand it in any capacity. In fact, it is quite unlike what Jesus himself says in Luke chapter 17. In Luke 17, Jesus uses this comparison. Beginning in verse 7, Which of you, having a slave plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come in from the field, Come immediately and sit down to eat. But will he not say to him, prepare something for me to eat, and properly clothe yourself, and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you may eat and drink? He does not thank the slave, because he did the things which were commanded, does he? So you too, when you do all the things which are commanded you, say, we are unworthy slaves, we have done only that which we ought to have done. Now, it's basically saying, masters don't wait on their slaves, they don't even reward their slaves for doing what is expected of them, they certainly don't thank them, you don't thank somebody for doing their job because it's expected that they do their job. Now, does that contradict what Jesus said in Luke 12? Well, no. I mean, there's, there's a, this is the thing about analogies is you can stretch them to a certain point. But on the one hand, you know, there is a reward that is given for readiness. But on the other hand, when Christ returns in judgment, you know, suppose you've been a perfect person, you've done everything that's expected of you, which that's true of none of us, by the way. The Lord doesn't owe you a thing. God, doesn't, God never owes you anything. But He will choose to reward those who await His coming and who love His return and His appearing. It is as Paul wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 4. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says in verse 7 and 8, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved His appearing. God has a reward in store for those who are eagerly awaiting and expecting His return. For us who are just anxious for Him to come back and who desire for His return, He has a reward. 
But some people don't desire the Lord's return. They don't want the Lord to catch them doing all the bad stuff they're doing. Or they want to pretend that the Lord doesn't exist. Or that He doesn't have any say in this world. But in those who prepare for His coming, and those who love His appearing, and await eagerly for it, there is a reward for them. They do not know when He's coming. But they are watching eagerly, and awaiting it all the same. Now suppose that master returns to his house. He found out all his servants had turned out the lights, and they'd gone to bed. They were not ready to greet him at his return. What would that master decide? Well, it's time to hire some new help. That's what. Time to get somebody else to do this. There will be no blessing on slaves who lie down on the job. Don't live your life in such a way that the Lord will look at you, his servant, when he returns and says, I need, some, I need to hire some new help. Don't live your life that way. Of course, you know, it kind of uses an opposite analogy. You know, some people you don't want coming to your house. Thieves. And thieves do not keep schedules, do they? No. And Jesus says, you know, if the master had known when the thief was coming, he would have made adequate preparations. He would have stopped him from breaking in at that particular time. And he says in the same way, you, now you're no longer the servant in the analogy, now you're the master, you make proper preparations. Because the Lord, the Son of Man, is coming at an hour that you do not expect. You know that, you, know, some, you always occasionally see in the news these end of the world predictions. Somebody's, you know, fixed a date for when the Lord's coming back. I got news for you, that's probably not going to be the day. I feel pretty good about that day. Um, what's, the, what's the lesson from that? He's coming at an hour that you do not expect. He's coming at a time when you are not really going to be prepared for him. He's like a thief. You know, I don't know about you, I've never met a thief who was, uh, you know, who has left a written reminder or something whenever uh, he's going to break into your house. Um, typically, thieves don't send you iCalendar notifications whenever they're trying to, you know, they're, they're going to break into your house and take all your stuff. The main issue here is timing. Thieves never alert the people they're going to rob with their schedule. Jesus is not going to alert us with his timetable either. He's not going to send us any notifications for his return. He will simply come back. Well, you know, that has implications for us, doesn't it? You know, the day of the Lord is frequently compared to the coming of a thief in the night. Matthew 24, 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 Peter 3. On and on we can go. But it says something about what our attitude should be too. Don't put off preparing for the Lord's return. Well, you know, I mean, I'd love to be involved in the Lord's work, but i got too much stuff on my plate right now. i got too many things i got to be doing. It can wait a couple months. It can wait a week. It can wait till tomorrow. It can wait till tomorrow. You have no idea if you're going to have time later. The Lord could come back tomorrow. He could come back today. He could come back before this sermon is over. That sounds crazy, but it's true. The Lord will come at an hour when you do not expect Him. And that could, this could be the hour. He could come back a thousand years later too. But... Why live your life in such a way that you don't think He's coming back? That is precisely the opposite of what Jesus says to do. Jesus said, be dressed in readiness. Keep your lamps lit. Live as if He were coming back today. Because you don't know if you have time later. The best time to work for the Lord is right now. The best time to get your act together is right now. The best time to you know, get your house in order... And submit to the gospel right now. Well, of course, Peter has a question here. Well, G Jesus, are, are you just talking to us? Or are you talking to everybody else around you? I can't help but think that Luke kind of recorded that one for our benefit because, you know, it, this isn't something that's just for 12 guys. You know, sometimes I'll hear people, they'll try to limit certain passages of Scripture to, you know, this only applies to the 12 apostles. It doesn't have anything to do with us. No, they'll... You know, chop whole chapters out of application in the Bible, which I just got to say, you know, maybe there are some small handful of passages in the gospel that really have no application to us in that sense. But I suspect that number isn't that big. I suspect we need to be very careful about that kind of approach. It's recorded and written for our benefit. The things that were written to them were also written for our learning. You know, that statement in Romans 15 about how you know whatever was written before times was written for our instruction so that we might have hope through the Scriptures... You know, that's technically talking about the Old Testament Scriptures in context. But, I mean, 
Don't pretend that the New Testament doesn't have that application attached to it as well. It's written for our encouragement and our instruction. And the truth is that what was written to the apostles was also written for our benefit and our learning. Jesus doesn't answer Peter's question. You know, Peter goes, well, Jesus, is that just for us or is that for everybody? You know, Jesus doesn't say, oh, that's just for you. And he doesn't say that's for everybody here. Instead, he asks another question. You've got to love it, uh, the way Jesus handles questions. Sometimes he doesn't always give everybody a straight answer. In verse 42, he says, Who is the faithful and sensible steward who his master will put in charge of his servants to give them their rations at the proper time? Essentially, that's a rephrasing of Peter's question, isn't it? You know, who should be ready? Who is the faithful servant? Who is that person? Well, some might think that some of the people that were there in that Jewish community might have thought it was the Pharisees or the chief priests or the religious rulers. I mean, because, you know, they're the ones that have the law and the scriptures. They're the ones who, you know, we're expecting to be in the ruling class in this kingdom. Maybe they thought that the twelve disciples even might be that elite ruling class. Maybe somebody thought Jesus' personal, physical family, like Mary and James and Jude, would have been the special ruling class. But Jesus answers the question in verse 43, Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. The one whom God blesses is the one who does his will. That's always been the case. The slave that gets rewarded is the one that fulfills his duty. The one that is dressed in readiness. The one that will be given greater charge over the house. And so the last thing you want to be doing is saying, oh, well, he'll be a long time in coming. Develop an attitude of complacency. Is the master really coming back? He probably won't be back today. Or tomorrow. Or the next day. Or next week. Oh, I got all this free time. What should I do with it? Hmm. I know. I can indulge myself however I like. I can beat my fellow servants. And then I can clean up the mess when he, before he gets back and he'll never know. That's kind of like the rich fool in chapter 12, verses 16 through 21. This slave forgets to take his master into account. He makes plans, but he doesn't put his master into those plans. Because the master will come when he is not expecting. The slave will be caught with his pants down. And when that happens, the master will cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful. Is that where you want to be? What about us? No, don't abuse your fellow servants. Don't abuse your brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, it's amazing some of the things Christians will bicker and complain about. Some brethren are just dead set on devouring one another, it seems. And what if Jesus came right back in the middle of one of those heated arguments? What if Jesus came right back in the middle of one of our silly complaints? What if Jesus came back, you know, while you were trying to tear someone down on the internet or while you were out doing shots at a bar? What if Jesus came back while you were in the middle of grumbling about some inconsequential detail? What if Jesus came back in the middle of a family squabble? Would you be embarrassed at that? You should be embarrassed all, regardless of whether he comes back because he sees it and it's going on. That goes for all of us. The truth is, we should be living our lives as if he were coming back today. As if he were coming back this very hour. There is no way around that. I am embarrassed and I am ashamed to think that what Jesus would happen if he had returned at some of the more uh, weak moments in my life. Am I always dressed in readiness? I need to change that about myself. Or am I complacent? I got all my ducks in a row. I've checked off my five, you know, five step checkbox for the week. No. I can just, I've done what I need to. I can take off and go to sleep on the job. No. There is no sleeping on the job. Eh. You know. And never mind those who bully and extort their fellow servants. Not like his absence is a long way away. Live your life as if he were coming today. And there are two kinds of slaves described in verses 47 and 48. And ignore the PowerPoint. I got a verse number wrong up there. Verses 47 through 48. Uh, the slave, there's a slave that knew his master's will and there's one that did not know his master's will. The one who knew what his master wanted, he's going to receive many lashes. He knew better he will be punished more severely. If you know the right thing to do it, well, if you know the right thing to do and you don't do it, that's high-handed sin. If you know the wrong thing to do and you do it anyway, that's high-handed sin. That is defiance. Jesus does not take kindly to those who knowingly flaunt his will. 
The book of Numbers chapter 15 said that there was no sacrifice in Israel for that high-handed, obstinate sin. The one who knew what it... Now, there are some people that don't know what their master wanted. And that they didn't know what their master wanted, well, they only get a few lashes. This guy still violated his master's will. He still gets punished. But it's not as severe. He's not punished as severely because he didn't know. Sins that are unintentional, they can be atoned for with sacrifice. But sins that are committed in pure defiance can never be atoned for. That's an implicit jab at the Pharisees right there. They've been given so much that much will be required of them. That's why he makes that statement at the end of verse 49. From everyone who has been given much, much will be required. And to whom they entrusted much, of him they will ask all the more. Not every Christian has the same expectation of them. But every Christian will be measured by what they were capable of. That's the standard that Jesus will lay against us. Now some people, and this is the reason for this question, is ignorance bliss. Now some people they say, you know, you'll teach them a certain amount and then they'll say... I don't want to know anymore. I don't want to be held accountable. I got, a, I got news for you. Deliberately choosing ignorance is called willful sin. It is defiance by definition. You know enough to know that there's something you should know. So why would you pretend otherwise? If you know enough, <laughs> if you know enough to make the statement, I don't want to know anymore because I don't want to be accountable, then it's already too late. You're already accountable. That's the, that's the thing. It's too late to hide behind your own lack of knowledge. Igno- deliberately choosing ignorance will not protect you from judgment. Now some people, not every, not all Christians are the same. You've got your ten talent Christians. Some people are ten talent Christians. You better produce ten talent results. Maybe you're a two talent Christian. Maybe you're a one talent Christian. You're still expected to produce two or one talent results. But the more you know, the more that you have been given, the more responsible you're going to be held personally. If you're going to be dressed in readiness, then don't waste your knowledge, don't waste your ability, don't waste your skill, and don't waste your time. Prepare for the judgment day. Be ready. But also be ready for something else. Be ready for distress. I have come to cast fire on the earth. I'm picking up in verse 49. I have come to cast fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to bring peace on earth? I tell you no, but rather division. For now, from now on, five members in one household will be divided. Three against two, and two against three. They will be divided father against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. And he was also saying to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say a shower is coming, and so it turns out. And when you see a south wind blowing, you say it will be a hot day, and it turns out that way. You hypocrites. You know how to analyze the appearance of the earth and the sky, but why do you not analyze this present time? And why do you not even on your own initiative judge what is right? For while you are going with your opponent to appear before the magistrate on your way there, make an effort to settle with him so that he may not drag you before the judge and the judge turn you over to the officer and the officer throw you into prison. I say to you, you will not get out of there until you have paid the very last cent. That's scary. What kind of distress are we talking about? Fire and baptism. Jesus came to bring fire on the earth. He has a baptism to undergo. What does that mean? Wait a second, wait a second. Wasn't Jesus already baptized in Luke chapter 3 and verses 21 and 22? Well, yeah. But baptism is an implicit reference to his death. This is actually, there's a similar usage of this idea in Mark chapter 10. Uh, Jesus uses the cup of wrath imagery and the baptism imagery to talk about his fate on the cross. In Mark chapter 10 in verses 38 through 39, The disciples are asking, if James and John in particular are asking, can we sit on your right and left hand? Jesus says, but you don't know what you're asking for. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? He said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to him, the cup that I drink you shall drink, and you shall be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. But to sit on my right or on my left, that is not mine to give, but it is for those whom it has been prepared. The cup, a reference to the cup of wrath, is the judgment that Jesus endures at the cross. 
But the immersion is similarly parallel to immersion into death. A kind of proverbial drowning, if you will. You know, baptism is talking about dipping, plunging, immersing, washing. But in this case, it's talking about death. Of course, Jesus didn't die by drowning. He died by being crucified. But the connection is there all the same. Romans chapter 6 makes a similar analogy. In verse 3, it says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into His death? Therefore, we have been buried with Him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we become united with Him in the likeness of His death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection. Knowing that our old self was crucified with Him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who died is freed from sin. The only way you can be saved is if you follow Jesus. And the only way you can follow Jesus is if, if you do what Jesus said and take up the cross and follow Him. And the only way you can take up the cross... Well, you're taking up the cross to be united with Him in His death. And the only way you can be united in His death is clearly through baptism. Jesus is distressed at the prospect of being baptized though. Why? Because nobody wants to die. That's not fun. I've never died before, so I wouldn't know, but you know, I'm generally thinking nobody, most people don't want to die. It's not something that people enjoy the, the idea of. And I've heard some people argue for the importance of baptism and say, well, I don't understand why you just won't get baptized. It's so simple. Well, on the one hand, yeah. But on the other hand, I mean, it is simple on one hand, but in another sense, it's not. We're asking people to effectively drown themselves, are we not? We are asking people to take up the cross and follow Jesus. That is a hard calling. Not everybody is able to do that. And we can wish away the old man of sin all we want. We can pray in our hearts that he'll go away. But until we actually kill him and bury him, we still have, he still has a hold on our lives. So yes, baptism is a source of distress. It is demanding that we crucify ourselves. It is demanding that we destroy the person we were before and replace ourselves with something new, something remade in the image of God, something that, something that gives us freedom from the judgment. If that distressed Jesus, that ought to distress us too. But it's not going to be hunky-dory right away. Jesus didn't, did Jesus come to bring peace on earth? Well, on the one hand, you know, chapter 2, you know, the angels saying, peace on earth towards everyone with whom God is pleased. That was at his birth. But Jesus says, I didn't come to bring peace on the earth. I came to bring a sword. The message of peace is really a message of division. It's a message that destroys families. The, the family unit, the closest, intimate, most intimate example of human relationships is being ripped apart by the message of the cross. So much for everybody getting along. The message of peace results in division. That's the issue here. Jesus applies this quote in the situation of the disciples. The acceptance of the gospel, the proclaiming of its message, provides a good chance that father and mother aren't going to like you anymore. You know, you become a Christian, there's a, there's a possibility that some of your family will turn on you. Anyone who chooses father or mother over Jesus does not deserve Jesus, though. That's a demand that's implied here and explicitly stated elsewhere. In fact, Luke 14 goes so far as to say... That whoever does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters and even his own life cannot be my disciple. Luke 14, 26. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Really think about this. Really think about the cost of following Jesus. Because not everybody can do it. Not everybody can endure this distress. It's not going to be a peaceful life. Are you sure you want to do it? He is offering you a peaceful life in the next life. He's offering you an eternity with Him. And so the great benefits surely outweigh the cost. But don't let anyone fool you into thinking that there is no cost. It'll cost you something alright. It'll cost you everything you have right now. Are you following Jesus with that understanding? Because if you're putting one hand to the plow and looking back, Jesus says in Luke chapter 9 that you are not fit for the kingdom of God. That's a tough teaching to swallow. It sounds unreasonable, doesn't it? To the world standards, it is unreasonable. 
but by the power of God who created all that we know as reality, who himself is truth. What hope do we have beyond that? But to give up all that we have to follow him. In addition to that, Jesus talks about signs. <laughs> signs of the times. Wait a second, didn't I just say that we can't know when Jesus is coming back, when judgment is coming? Well, yeah. And Jesus calls them out on their hypocrisy here. He says, you know, you guys are better at predicting the weather than understanding the signs of Jesus. I don't know how the people of Jesus' day got such advanced meteorological expertise because we can't figure out how to predict the weather in our own day. You think about that. But in many ways, this is an answer to what Jesus says, to what they were demanding in chapter 11 and verse 16. When some, to test Him, were asking for a sign from Him. Give us a sign, Jesus. Well, the truth is Jesus has given them many signs. And He still has a greater sign to give, one that is seen in the cross. He will be lifted up a cross as a sign to that generation. He will be raised on the dead. He will be raised from the dead on the third day as a sign to all. And these signs point to an impending judgment. In one sense, a judgment on the city of Jerusalem and the end of the Jewish nation. But on the other sense, it is coming on the whole world. And the whole world needs to learn from the signs of Jesus. And I'll say this, the signs of the time, yeah, there are signs. They're not signs of the when. They're signs of the what. Jesus was clear. The time of judgment is not known. It comes like a thief. You will not know the exact day or the hour. And any attempt that's out there, don't get distracted by any attempt to predict when it's going to happen. That's just a distraction crafted by Satan. Rather, see the sign that Jesus performed and realize that we are now living in a time where Jesus could come back any day and that we need to be ready for that. And since judgment is coming, he says, judge on your own initiative. Settle out of court. You do not want this thing to go to trial. Because i got news for you. There ain't an attorney on the face of the earth that can help defend you against the charges that are going to be brought against you on Judgment Day. It's better to settle your case with your opponent ahead of time than to go to trial. And it's especially true if you're guilty. <laughs> hey, if you can settle out of court instead of having to endure shame and humiliation and punishment, then do it. And the truth is, we all have an appointment with the judge. We all are guilty as can be. The evidence is totally stacked against us. And if we go to the judge, the judge will throw us into the prison of hell. And we will never get out of there until we have paid the unpayable debt. Do you want to do that? Because I don't. Jesus. Jesus offers each and every one of us a chance to settle out of court. If we are His disciples, if we are dressed in readiness at His return, if we truly love His appearing, we have taken up the cross and become His disciple and followed Him. Oh, there's hope. we take up our cross and follow Him, if we undergo the baptism with Him, if we devote our lives to Him, and if we stay dressed in readiness, we have a hope of heaven and the kingdom itself. Don't waste this opportunity. Settle out of court before the judgment day comes. Take out your songbooks. Conclude the lesson this morning. How can you settle out of court? Maybe you're living your life and you haven't made peace with your Lord. You haven't been immersed into Him for the forgiveness of your sins. Or perhaps you've gone astray. You've stopped following the Lord. And you need to make peace with Him right now. Don't put it off. Like I said, it could come tomorrow. It didn't come, he didn't come back before I finished most of the sermon. But He could come back any time. And we need to be always ready for it. There's something we can do to make your life right with the Lord. Let it be known. All together we stand and we sing.